Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and tonight is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD. It's a webinar where we're going to talk about Lyme disease, as we do on most uh, Thursdays here. Um, so I see a number of new names here. And so for those of you that are new, welcome. And I also see a number of people that have come back. So I'm glad to see those that have come back uh, are getting some value out of this. At least I think you're getting value out of it. Uh, the way that you participate, if you're new here, there's a couple ways. Number one, um, I'm going to take questions that people have written. I'll read them and, uh, and then I'll give a response. So that's one way you can see how I respond to those questions. The other way that you can participate is to write a question to me. And the way you could do that is over on the right-hand side of the screen um, on the bottom, there is a chat box and you can use that chat box to write your question to me, okay? The only thing I ask is that you try to keep it on the shorter side. Uh, long questions will not work in this format. And if they're really long, I just, I won't be able to get to them at all. Um, the other thing is uh, while I am um, doing, uh, read, uh, working on the questions, I will read them out loud. And those of you that are participating in the live version, though I'm actually gonna post it on the screen. So you'll be able to see them in the live version. The questions do not show up in the recorded version on the screen though. So yes, I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar and uh, I should have that ready for you to take a look at uh, tomorrow morning by around nine or 9.30 Seattle time, so Pacific Standard Time. Um, I'll take a little bit of this evening to go ahead and edit that up and get it out to you and then I'll provide comments on it. Uh, usually some kind of a summary I send out with this, so you have a better chance of being able to figure out where I said what I said. All right, so we'll get that out to you in the morning. Uh, when you get that uh, tomorrow morning, uh, send it to people you know that might get benefit as well too. So when you get that email um, that announces it's done, and tells you what to do, forward it to people because the more people that I reach, the more people I'm able to help and you can help me in my quest to reach as many people as possible to help, okay? So um, yeah, I think that takes care of all the business material here. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started here? Hello, Dave. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I have been taking activated charcoal, curcumin, vitamin C and D, zinc, and glutathione for black mold treatment for almost two weeks. I'm having a pretty good, bad stomach groin pains, and my mouth gums are also irritated and painful. Are these side effects of activated charcoal, or are these symptoms simply as a result of my body detoxing or removing the mold from my system? Could it be a Lyme Bartonella babesia flare-up? If it is the charcoal, should I just push through it? Perhaps another binder? Any recommendations would be greatly appreciated. All right. So Dave, to, um, so let me just make some comments. And I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to answer your questions specifically for you, because I would need to ask you some clarifying questions that I'm not going to be able to do in, in this kind of a format. Okay. But whenever you... Um, so and as many of you know, when you have symptoms of mold toxicity or you have symptoms of Lyme disease, there's a common thread between them. And that is uh, both mold toxins in you and Lyme infection in you and co-infections in you trigger your immune system to overproduce a bunch of chemicals called cytokines, okay? So cytokines are good and bad. And when white blood cells see an infection or see a toxin, or see yeast in your intestines, um, they will manufacture cytokines. And the good side, those cytokines are meant to turn on your immune system so it will deal with the problem. They cause more white blood cells to be made, they draw the white blood cells to where the infection is and they help them work better, okay? But in the situation of mold toxin illness and in Lyme and in yeast overgrowth, uh, the immune system often doesn't do a good job and it keeps trying harder and harder and eventually it makes too many cytokines, okay? So symptoms of too many cytokines include fatigue, body pain, uh, poor thinking, poor sleep, uh, hormonal system disruption, body pains. Um, you got the picture, right? So what we call Lyme symptoms and what we call mold toxicity symptoms are actually excess cytokine symptoms, okay? Now, in the case of killing Lyme germs, we sometimes will trigger something called a Herxheimer reaction, which is as we see, um, as the immune system sees the dead germ parts, it will manufacture and release more cytokines. So when you start killing germs, guess what gets worse? 
all of your germ symptoms get worse because you make more cytokines, okay? In the case of mold toxin illness, as you start uh, pulling toxins out, the movement of toxins uh, created by using a binder, like your charcoal here, for instance, the movement of toxins will trigger more cytokines to be made. So you'll get a cytokine surge, okay? So if the act of detoxing is making you worse, usually that means your underlying symptoms that were triggered by cytokines should also get worse, okay? So look at your symptoms, Dave, and just look at what were your symptoms of mold toxicity? And if the various things that are flaring in you are the same kind of symptoms you were having before you started the binders, then it's probably due to a cytokine surge from pulling those toxins out of you, okay? All right. In terms of side effects that I usually see activated charcoal cause, I mean, it can cause dark stools, might cause a little bit of nausea um, as side effect. Now, there's a cytokine surge, okay? And uh, sometimes it can give a little bit of constipation, but usually not, all right? So I would suspect what you're describing here is probably more due to a cytokine surge from the act of detoxing, all right? And so what I like people to do to control those cytokines, the things that can make it so you can get through your binders more rapidly or more tolerably, is to do things to lower cytokines. And my favorite thing to lower cytokines is to use curcumin. Uh, curcumin is a component of the seasoning turmeric. It gets inside your white blood cells and limits their ability to make cytokines. And it the product I like is a product by Thorne called Mariva 500 SF. SF stands for sunflower. And that is because it's curcumin that's microscopically wrapped in fat to increase its absorption. It's a liposomal form of curcumin. Curcumin and turmeric on their own are horribly absorbed uh, from your stomach, okay? But if you do a, a liposomal formula like the Mariva 500, then that usually will help um, take care of the situation and get better absorption, okay? So the first thing I usually will do is, is uh, 500 milligrams three times a day of curcumin. If that's not enough, I'll have a person go up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day, all right? The other thing I would do if somebody is really struggling with uh, a cytokine flare is I will add in mm -hmm. liposomal um, uh, glutathione. Uh, glutathione is a very strong antioxidant that lowers oxidizing agents that are telling your white blood cells to make cytokines. It also helps remove some toxins, uh, it helps your liver remove toxins a bit easier as well too. And I'll have a person use a liposomal variety of that too. Uh, and the liposomal product I like is made by uh, Research Nutritionals. It's a product called TriFortify. There's a TriFortify orange and a TriFortify watermelon. You can pick your flavor, okay? And usually I have a person do one teaspoon once a day. And if it's really, they're really having a cytokine flare problem, I'll have them do one teaspoon two times a day. Okay. All right. So Dave, I hope that gives you some information to work with there. All right. And good luck to you. Looks like this is a, another question. I'm not sure if this is the same day, but it may be. Um, hi, Dr. Ross. I have a positive Babesia fish test, which was done through Igenix. I also have an AD titer for Babesia decani, uh, which Igenix also listed as indicates active infection. Based on this, how likely do you think it is that this Babesia test is accurate and I have an active Babesia infection? Does a positive Babesia fish test almost always indicate active infection. My main symptoms are neuropathy in the feet and legs, cold feet, pruning fingers, OCD, nasal congestion, and slight shortness of breath. I also tested positive through Igenix for Bartonella and Lyme. I'm trying to figure out if I should treat all three infections or just Bartonella and Lyme. Thanks for doing these amazing webinars. Um, so uh, the Babesia fish test is a microscope exam that uses a fluorescent marker that is designed to attach to Babesia genetic material. And that process is called fluorescent insight to hybridization, which is why we use the word fish, fluorescent insight to uh, hybridization, okay? If you actually see a germ under the microscope, that means it is living in in you. 
All right. So that, yes, that means you've got Babesia. Um, in terms of the uh, IFA test that um, that uh, Igenix did for a Babesia, this Babesia to IFA, that's an antibody test. That's measuring, um, is your immune system reacting against the germ? And immune system reaction does not always prove a germ is in you, but it's an indication it could be in you, okay? So in this case, you have an immune reaction and you have a strong fish test that's positive. You got the, you got the Babesia infection, all right? Usually in my practice, um, when somebody has three infections of Babesia, Bartonella, and Babesia, in general, my inclination is to go after Lyme and Bartonella first. And then after a couple months of getting Bartonella under control, if Bartonella seems to be getting better based on symptoms, then at that point I might add in treatment to also cover for Babesia. The reason I stage my treatments that way is based on observation of Burriscano. Burriscano is a uh, Lyme treatment pioneer here in the States that many of us learned how to manage Lyme from. And it was his observation and his practice out on Long Island that um, if he went after a Babesia before clearing or getting Bartonella under better control, it became much more difficult to get rid of Bartonella, okay? So I follow that teaching from him and that's what I do. Now, there are situations where I might break that rule. <laughs> and where I break that rule is if somebody has severe symptoms of Babesia and it is clear to me that mostly it's their Babesia that's driving the show, okay? In that case, I might do Lyme and Babesia first, and then gradually add in a Bartonella treatment. Your symptoms primarily, the only thing I see from what you said here that you have that would suggest possible Babesia is a shortness of breath. Keep in mind Bartonella can give shortness of breath too. Other symptoms that can indicate Babesia usually are drenching night sweats, uh, air hunger is one. You just mentioned that shortness of breath I call air hunger. Uh, racing and skipping of the heart, sometimes you can see Babesia. Babesia also can give a lot of frontal headaches. And Babesia also can sometimes give um, um, uh, a little red dot spots on your skin, basically, too, okay? And then there's a strange Babesia symptom that some people get, which is uh, some people with Babesia have very frequent deja vu experiences, okay? So, um from what you've listed here, though, you only have one symptom, and that would be the air hunger. When you, and based on what you wrote here, again, I'm not your doctor, okay? I don't get to ask you thousands of questions to figure it all out. But based on what you said here, I would see there's more of an issue of Bartonella and Lyme, and I would probably go for that first. Ultimately, you should talk to your doctor and find out what they recommend, though, okay? Because I, in this forum, I can't be your doctor. I can give you general ideas, but um, these are things you should talk over with your doctor, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Dave. Hello, Dave again. And Dave, this is probably the last question I'll take from you. But the only thing is I can't tell if it's the same Dave. But um, I, I will probably shy away from taking questions from Dave until I get to other people's questions. But we'll do one more. Let's see. I see you recommend BPC-157 for Lyme and mold illness. Do you recommend taking this peptide after your mold treatment is completed, or can you take it simultaneously if taking together? Will the binders also bind the peptide or diminish its potency? How many pills do you take daily? Thanks. Um, so at this point in my practice, I am not using BPC-157 right at the beginning of treatment. And the reason is it's very expensive, and it's not clear to me everyone needs to be on it, okay? so. Everyone, BPC-157 is a peptide uh, that is made in the stomach lining. And peptides are um, uh, strands of amino acids of 50 or less. If you start getting over 50 strands of amino acids put together, we call that a protein. Okay, so these are like short of being proteins. They're called peptides. And BPC-157 has a number of things it can do, but it repairs the stomach uh, if you've got GI problems. It can help uh, repair injury to muscles, tendons, ligaments, and your joints, and can help repair damage to nerves too, okay? Now, keep in mind when you have active Lyme or Bartonella or Babesia, a lot of the problems you're having are not due to damage to the joints. They're more due to the inflammatory cytokines. So before I would start having somebody take BPC-157 to repair damage, 
I would try to get your germs under control and just see if that in itself, getting the germs under control is enough to lower the inflammation and therefore deal with your problems without having to do a BPC-157. Same thing with mold toxin illness. I would spend about a good six months trying to get your mold toxins down. And if you are, and that may be enough to take care of the problem without ever having to do the expense of repairing problems with the BPC-157, okay? That would be my inclination. This BPC-157 to do injury repair is something I would consider doing six months to nine months into treatment, not as an initial thing, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you. All right, so everyone, I um, wanna show you one, I'm gonna show a few things to you here. All right, so I'm gonna do a screen share. Okay, so earlier this week, I, I think it was this week, I released an article on peptides, um, which gives you kind of a walkthrough on the oral peptides. So click on my latest tab here. And here is the article called Repair and Restore with Peptides and Lyme and Multoxin Illness. And in here, I walk through and describe the various oral peptides that are available. Uh, and I tell you when and how to go about using them, okay? Um, the only thing I might want to do based on your question is update uh, when to use this to say wait until you get partly into your treatment. And if you're treating your germs or your multoxins isn't helping, then add these in. Okay, that's kind of the clarifying comment I just said. I would wait about six to nine months, basically. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question. Hello, Jim. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for these great webinars. You're welcome. I see I've been taking Cemento at 26 drops uh, twice per day for several years because it seems to be effective at helping keep Lyme and other bugs, bugs re reasonably in check. Will this have serious negative impact on my microbiome? Should I be doing this? I'm also putting polysporin into each nostril twice a day to keep a skin infection on my nose from flaring up. Will this have serious negative impact on the microbiome? So um, in term, so microbiome, everyone, means the, the, in, the germs that live in your gut, okay? And those germs are made up of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and even fungus and yeast, all right? So there's a lot of things that live in our intestines. And to put this into context, the microbiome, the genetic material of all those germs that live in our gut, it makes up 90% of our body's genetic material. So 10% of us, our genetic material is us. 90% <laughs> is from all those germs that we let right along in our gut. Right now, we're letting them right along in our gut because we're getting something from them, okay? So the microbiome helps with uh, food digestion. Microbiome can remove toxins. The microbiome can remove things we're allergic to. The microbiome uh, makes chemicals that tell your brain to work correctly. Microbiome releases chemicals that keep us out of depression. Uh, microbiome um, releases chemicals that help your immune system work better. So there's good reasons to support that microbiome. Now, in Lyme disease, we, you know, we take risk when we use antibiotics. We risk the effect on the microbiome of using antibiotics because the risk of not doing something to get your Lyme germs under control is greater than the harm we might cause to the microbiome. All right, that's kind of the calculus that you're using. Okay. Now, when it comes to the effect of different things on the microbiome, prescription antibiotics have a greater chance of injuring the microbiome compared to herbal antibiotics. And the chances of getting some injury to the microbiome from herbal antibiotics are probably small, but not non-existent from using herbal antibiotics. Okay. And the reason I say that is a sign that the microbiome could be in trouble is if you're treating with, um, treat, so for instance, a sign that uh, something, uh, a sign that microbiome is out of balance is if you get too many yeast, okay? And so in a number of my patients that I use herbal antibiotics to treat their Lyme, a number will still go on and get yeast overgrowth. Now, it does not happen with any degree to the way that it happens when they use prescription antibiotics but occasionally somebody will get uh, yeast overgrowth in their intestines 
suggesting that even herbal antibiotics are disturbing the microbiome. Okay, so it's, but it's a small chance, it's a lot less. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth doing a small chance of a microbiome uh, injury being on Cemento in return for treating something uh, that may or may not be active, like the Lyme? And, and I can't answer that question for you. That's something you need to think about, okay? Uh, but there is a chance you could get to some injury. In terms of the polysporin, um, so even though it's a topical agent you're putting up here in your nose, there can be slight absorption of uh, the chemicals uh, into your nose and therefore getting into the blood and therefore eventually working its way down to the intestines. But I would suspect it's a very, very small risk of any harm happening from that. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Jim. Hello, Victoria. <clears throat> Hold on here just a minute. I have another swig of coffee here. Let's see. Uh, dear Dr. Ross, which source of grapefruit seed extract would you recommend? Liquid versus capsules. Uh, number two, have you ever treated patients who describe their main symptom in addition to fatigue as sensations of buzzing, quivering, or like cell phone vibrating all over their body? that can increase or slightly uh, decrease throughout the day, but never go away and gradually progressing? If yes, which bug? Borrelia, Babesia, Bartonella, would you attribute such symptoms? Have you had success with treating them so the symptoms will eventually go away? Thank you very much for all your webinars and for sharing your knowledge and experience. Uh, great. So Victoria, thank you for the, those kind words. Let me just make comments here. So grapefruit seed extract, everyone is an herbal medicine that has effect at uh, decreasing the Lyme cyst, okay? So the Lyme term, uh, let me just describe terms here real quick, okay? So this is my Lyme terminology 101, all right? So the Lyme germ, the Lyme, which is also known as Borrelia, um, exist in two different uh, appearances that you can see, okay? And those appearances are a corkscrew looking thing called a spirochete, and the spirochete can morph into small cyst forms, okay? Now that's what lives outside of cells, all right? There's another form that lives inside of cells, which is called the L form, and the L form loses its covering and moves inside of cells and it exists there without a covering, basically, okay? All right, so these two ways that live outside of cells also have different growth states. They're either growing or the spirochete and cysts go into hibernation. And we call those hibernators where they slow their metabolism way down. We call those persisters, okay? We don't know whether an L form goes into a persister state inside of cells, okay? So when we talk about persisters, we're talking about a spirochetes and cysts that have gone into hibernation. Some of the science would suggest maybe that's 10% of your germs. The majority of them are in a growing state. Okay, all right. So what works on these cysts that are outside of cells, one of the things that can work against them is grapefruit seed extract. Um, I, you could go with either the pills or the liquid, either work well. The pills, I like people to take a 250 milligram pill twice a day. If you're doing uh, the liquid, which would be something called citricidal, or you can get, actually just get a grapefruit seed extract liquid, usually want to go anywhere from five to 10 drops twice a day on that, okay? Some people experience the liquid as being stronger. Um, I see good benefits either way though, okay? <clears throat> In terms of the buzzing sensation, um, buzzing sensation is something I find to be unique for Bartonella. So when I've got somebody that's describing a lot of buzzing or vibrating, and it's more of a sensation that they have. It isn't something you can visibly see. I could see if I look at you or you could even see if you look at a person. I'm tending to think more of Bartonella. It's a sign of an agitated, an irritated nervous system, okay? And Bartonella tends to have a lot of neurologic and psychiatric effects, okay? So other symptoms that would make me think of Bartonella too would be a pain on the balls of the feet, um, uh, buzzing or vibrating, um, also tremors or shakes or seizures, 
severe cognitive problems. I mean, um, uh, usually it's a degree of cognition that worsening much greater than the worsening people have with energy, for instance, okay? A joint pain sometimes can have Bartonella as an effect, Lyme can too. Uh, Bartonella also can give air hunger. The way that it gives air hunger is it um, forms deposits with fibrin on the lining of your blood vessels, narrowing the openings of the blood vessels, making it so it's harder to get oxygen to your tissues and you start feeling like you're not getting enough oxygen. Okay, that's what air hunger is. And Bartonella also can sometimes give um, a rash that looks like stretch or scratch marks. Okay, those are things, other symptoms beside the buzzing and vibrating that would make me think of Bartonella. But that buzzing vibrating is pretty specific to Bartonella. All right, in terms of can it get better with treatment? Yeah, um, I think the majority of people whose Bartonella improves can get rid of the buzzing or vibrating sensation. Okay, with treatment, uh, with treating Bartonella, we'll usually take care of that. Okay. Uh, good luck to you, Victoria. Hello, Rich. Hi, Dr. Ross. These webinars are incredibly helpful and informative. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're you're getting some help here, and I'm glad you're you're finding these useful. Let's see. Do you typically recommend increasing your standard recommend doses of supplements for larger people? I am a man and weigh about uh, 210 pounds. Would I need a 50% higher dose of supplements compared to someone who weighs 140 pounds? Also, why are the recommended dose of cryptolepis and Sida Okuda tinctures so much higher than the tinctures for Hutonia, Cat's Claw, and Atobovar? So, Rich, um, you know, you make a good comment. I mean, the, the kind of dosing I recommend is for a person that's probably 150 to 170 pounds. And you could make an argument to do a proportional increase in the amount of dosing based on your weight relative to that 150 to 170 pound person, okay? In terms of the cryptolepis and Sida Akuta dosing, that's because those are the doses I find most effective. Um, I know the Sida Akuta dosing that I have is uh, what Buner recommends in his uh, information. Uh, the cryptolepis dosing is something I'd learned uh, working with it primarily as a Babesia treatment. I find the higher doses work better for that. And I've continued that into how I use it to treat Lyme and Bartonella. Keep in mind, everyone, that cryptolepis is an herb that came to us out of Ghana. Um, and we originally started using it as we knew that people in Ghana were having benefit using it for malaria. Babesia is a blood parasite that lives in red blood cells and acts like malaria. So we use malaria agents to treat it. But recent studies that got published out of Johns Hopkins University within the year, within the last 12 months, I should say, um, showed that cryptolepis can kill, in the laboratory at least, it can kill growing and persister Lyme, and it can treat growing and persister Bartonella. Pretty useful um, herb there, okay. And the Sita Akuda is something primarily recommended by Buner in his uh, books on how to manage Bartonella. And I find benefit using it as well too. And that dosing I have recommended in my articles is based on his recommendations, okay? And, and that's what I use in my practice is what I find uh, successful. But yeah, for your size, you may wanna increase a proportional amount on those, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. Hello, RC. Hello, Dr. Russ. I have mast cell and mold toxicity, but I am wondering, um, but I am wondering with a new partner if I had Epstein Barr as a child and HHV6 IgG, can they be passed by kissing? Anything to prevent that if it is passed that way? No way to connect if that's how it gets passed. I heard 90% of the population has HHV6. What is HHV6 anyway if, if it is not a sexually transmitted disease? They don't test for either in STD testing. Thank you. Okay, so HHV6 is a virus. It's a type of herpes virus, a non-sexually transmitted herpes, okay? I mean, herpes, um, genital herpes has sores, okay? That's sexually transmitted. That's, eight, that's called herpes simplex virus type two, okay? Herpes simplex virus type 1 is what gives you cold sores, uh, sores up here on your lips when it's active, and that can be transmitted by kissing. 
Now, technically, HSV1, which we think of as oral, and HSV2, which we think of as genital, or I may have those turned around, we, they actually can infect either your mouth or genital. So HSV1 and HSV2 can be here. HSV1 and HSV2 can be genital as well, too. Okay. And those would be the kind we think of as sexually transmitted or kissing transmitted. Okay. HHV6, human herpes virus type 6, is a respiratory um, herpes that um, uh, is chronic and lives in a lot of people. You're saying 90%. I'm saying maybe around 30% is what I see. But it's a virus that lives in healthy people and we cohabitate with it. So just like we have germs and bacteria that live in our skin, we have a bunch of microbes that live inside us and live inside our blood cells, and live inside of our cells, okay? HHV6 is one of those microbes that we cohabitate with in healthy people. It is true that in maybe, and then some people that get Lyme, that their HHV6, that the immune system loses the ability to keep it under control, and then HHV6 can add to the health problems that a person has. The treatment, though, is get your Lyme and your co-infections under control, and your immune system will start putting it back under control. Same thing with Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus in many of us becomes a chronic virus that lives in us that our immune system keeps under control. I do not consider Epstein-Barr or HHV6 to be sexually transmitted. I don't consider them other than when you have an active infection, like when you have active Epstein-Barr virus, when you, um, uh, when you first get it, when you have mono, because that's what it causes, then if you it's a respiratory, you could transmit it by breathing on somebody possibly kissing them. But for the people that, for all of us that have it living in us as just something we cohabitate with, it's not kissing transmitted and it's not sexually transmitted either. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck, TRC. Hello, John. Let's see. My family just received a real time mole test results. We all tested high positive for three mycotoxins. Can it be possible to have high levels of mycotoxins in your system but have no symptoms? My wife and son feel horrible. However, myself and my daughter feel fine. Thoughts? So, yes, it is possible to have high levels of mycotoxins in you and to have your system deal with it. Okay. And in terms of what is high, generally, if you're starting to get about four to five times the upper end of the detectable amount, so uh, real time and even um, uh, Great Plains labs have a range and they say that above this level they, is the detectable range, okay? Take whatever that top number is and multiply it by four or five. It's usually those levels that start causing a lot of problems, okay? So you can have a certain amount of mold toxins in you that's still above the detectable range, and they're going to call that positive. That is still not the level that usually causes most people health problems. All right? All right. Good luck to you, John. Hello, John. Let's see. For COVID, I know you recommend taking quercetin, curcumin, vitamin C, D, zinc, and glutathione to lower cytokines. My question is the following. Can you take Plaxivoy, um, Paxlovid and these supplements at the same time, or should you stop taking the supplements while on Paxlovid? Uh, you can take Paxlovid at the same time as those supplements. And in fact, um, I had a patient of mine that has, uh, uh, that has Lyme and um, that um, has, is fully vaccinated, but came down with, um, with COVID. And um, the recommendation I had for her was get on Paxlovid, which we did. And I told her to get on the glutathione, and the curcumin, and the quercetin, start lowering her cytokines down so that it would keep her from getting into the bad lung problems that sometimes people get uh, with uh, COVID. And so, yeah, it's, it's okay to do all those. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, John. In fact, I just, I just had that come up this uh, week ago, actually, with my one patient. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Tamara. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. You are my hero. <laughs> thank, thank you.
Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. I have a chronic Bartonella and I have a chronic Bartonella and Borreliosis. Which should I treat first? I have highly positive IgG for both. What is your opinion on necessarily of treating it? Despite having strong symptoms, these two aren't treated in the Czech Republic. So um, when I have a person that has symptoms of Lyme and of Bartonella and they have positive testing, I treat them, okay? So I wanna make a distinction. So if somebody tests positive for Lyme and Bartonella and they have no symptoms of it, I don't treat, all right? Keep in mind your, uh, that uh, if you don't have a symptoms of an illness and you get a positive test, there's a high chance of it being a false positive test. So don't treat a test. Use the test to inform you if you have a lot of symptoms, what the cause could be of those symptoms. And if you have a lot of symptoms of Bartonella and you have symptoms of Lyme, treat them, especially if you have a positive test. Okay, all right, so I just wanna make that comment, all right? And so I, you, could, you could treat both of them at the same time. Uh, there are a number of things you could use that would treat Lyme and Bartonella simultaneously, okay? So for instance, one way to treat Lyme and Bartonella at the same time is to use the prescription clarithromycin, 500 milligrams twice a day, along with the prescription called rifampin, 300 milligrams, two pills one time a day. That is a treatment that will work effectively against growing Bartonella and effectively against Lyme spirochete, Lyme cyst, and intracellular L-form Lyme, okay? Once a person is stable on that, I would add in liposomal cinnamon clove oregano to start treating one capsule twice a day of that to start treating for the persister uh, um, growth state of the germ. Keep in mind, 90% of those germs will probably be in a growing state, okay? All right, so that's one example. Another example of something you could do would be to use a, a tetracycline, like a doxycycline or a minocycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, coupled with fluconazole, also known as diflucan. Diflucan, which is something we traditionally use uh, to treat yeast, is also um, effective, can be effective against the cyst form of Lyme and can be effective against a Bartonella and may even help with uh, persister Bartonella, okay? And how I'm saying that is uh, Johns Hopkins University about two or three years ago now, I ran a number of experiments and one of the, uh, they, in their experiments trying to see what would be effective against uh, Bartonella, they um, used a representative member of every antimicrobial family, all right? So for the family called the Azoles, they use something called Clotrimazole, Another member of the azoles is fluconazole, also known as diflucan. The clotrimazole worked really well against growing and persister Bartonella. The trouble is it's not available in a pill form. It's only used as a topical agent. So many of us have started using other azoles like fluconazole and finding good success with that. Fluconazole is also in the same family, azoles that has metronidazole, tinidazole, which we use effectively as cyst busters in Lyme, and therefore fluconazole can treat the cyst too, okay? Menocycline would pick up, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, would pick up a spirochete Lyme, intracellular Lyme as well too, okay? And those tetracyclines also would be helpful along with diflucan and getting a Bartonella. So you can treat both at the same time. I just gave you two ways to do that, okay? All right. Uh, but obviously, talk it over with your physicians, and hopefully you can get somebody to prescribe for you on those, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you. Tamara, if you can't get somebody to prescribe, the other things to do um, are cat's claw and toba bark uh, for Lyme, and Houtania and Sita Acuda for Bartonella. You can find both of those described in my antibiotic guides for Lyme and my antibiotic guides for Bartonella. And in both those situations, I would also add liposomal cinnamon clove oregano uh, to deal with persisters as well too, okay? So in case you don't, you're not familiar with those articles, let me just show them to you real quick. All right, so take a look at my infection treatment plan section here. And in terms of what to use for Lyme, take a look at this article called a Lyme disease antibiotic guide, okay? And in here, I talk about your herbal options. I think I give them down here. 
as I sample, let's see here. Look at this. Um, you can do this herbal combination number one, which is the Otoba Bark and Cat's Claw, along with Cryptolepis. But you could also do it with the liposomal cinnamon clove that I mentioned in herbal combination number two. Okay. All right. And then um, <clears throat> in terms of the how to treat Bartonella herbally, take a look at my article called Kills Bartonella Brief Guide. And down here, I list a number of prescription options, but um, I also talk about using Houtonia, Sita Akuda, and liposomal cinnamon clove and oregano capsules in here. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Tamara. Hello, Margo. Let's see. I know you mentioned you like to use cat's claw and banderol and sidicuda and hutania, but have you found any others beneficial, such as andrographis, Japanese knotweed, knotweed resveratrol, and berberine? Um, so, um, in terms of the cat's claw and the banderol, which is also known as atoba bark, I found those very effective against Lyme. And I made a decision to start using those based on laboratory experiments by a researcher named Eva Shapi, uh, who produced her work about 10 years ago and published it in the Townsend Letter and showed that those two herbs together do a whopping kill of both cyst, spirochete lime, and remove biofilms, okay? More recent research shows that the cat's claw can actually deal with persister forms um, of lime as well too, and that's research out of Johns Hopkins. The Siddha Akuda and the Hutania are herbs, again, I learned about through Buner herbs. I find those are very effective against Bartonella uh, as well, too. Andrographis is something that Buner also recommends as something to treat the Lyme germ. However, um, if we look at some studies that got published out of Johns Hopkins uh, last year, Andrographis appears in laboratory experiments to have no benefit against Lyme at all. Buner chose to recommend it based upon its effect against another spirochete called leptospirosis. However, that does not appear, based on the Hopkins research, to be that effective against Lyme. And so I don't find benefit in using Andrographis, okay? The Japanese knotweed also is something that Buner recommends, and he would pair the Japanese knotweed with cat's claw instead of using Otoba. And I would admit that Japanese knotweed is an option you could use instead of the Atoba. However, I find better effect with Atoba, okay? But in Japanese knotweed, uh, based on what Buner writes, but also based on laboratory experiments conducted by Hopkins this last year, Japanese knotweed is effective against growing and persister lime, also is effective against growing and persister Bartonella, okay? Resveratrol, I'm not clear is that good as a germ killer. It's more of an anti-inflammatory. It does come from Japanese knotweed, but just singling out that chemical called resveratrol, not using a whole plant tincture, I don't find to be as effective, okay? And then finally, berberine is probably better at regulating uh, the microbiome than it is as a tick-borne infection germ killer, okay? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think of all these things you list here, in addition to cat's claw, banderol, which is a toba bark, sidacuda hutania, the only other one I would find effective for tick-borne illnesses is the Japanese knotweed. Andrographis, I just don't find it helpful. Resveratrol is better as an anti-inflammatory, and berberine is uh, more effective for uh, gut microbiome management, okay? All right, good luck to you, Margo. Hello, Thomas. Let's see. Is there anything that can be done for the blood volume? It's just an intuition, but I feel like I'm weak and anemic or dehydrated no matter how much water you drink. I add pink salt to my water and I take magnesium. Do you think it's important to also supplement potassium and calcium? 
So, Thomas, I don't know. Um, if you were my patient, I would do some basic uh, blood evaluations. I would want to get a, a blood count, a CBC, to see what your blood volume is, okay? I would also want to get um, something called a comprehensive metabolic profile that would give me a sense of how your kidney and liver are working, all right? And then finally, if you have an extreme thirst, I would do some evaluations to see if your brain is sending the right chemicals to concentrate your urine. And to do that, I would do a urine test um, call and look at the concentration of your urine. It's called a urine osmolality study. I would also do a blood osmolality study that looks at the concentration of, of your blood, okay? And then I would measure a chemical made by the brain called antidiuretic hormone. So I would do evaluation first before I can say what's the best way for you to go about um, dealing with this issue. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Thomas. Hello, Al. Is dosage for clarithromycin biaxin one pill twice a day or two pills twice a day? Both doses are listed in your protocol. Is it more potent than doxy? I have to go look at my protocol. I may have something wrong there. It's 500 milligrams as one pill twice a day. Okay. All right. In fact, <laughs> you have me wanting to look at that right now. Let me let me take a double look at that. I'm going to do a quick screen share here, everyone. All right. So um, my protocol is this Lyme protocol. And this is kind of the skeleton of the different things you want to do to address infections. So in the Lyme infection section, I have clarithromycin, 500 milligrams, one pill, two times a day. All right. And then let me see what I say in the Bartonella section. I have it as 500 milligrams, one pill, two times a day, too. So I'm not sure where you're seeing it unless it's in one of my other articles. I'm not sure where that is. All right. So it's 500 milligrams, one pill, twice a day. All right. Good luck to you all. Oh, and is it more potent than doxy? Um, you know, it. Uh, I, th I find they're both pretty potent, okay? Um, the advantage of doxy is that when you use it as your starting agent, it also could be very effective against anaplasma and erlichia if you have them. Um, anaplasma and erlichia are not effectively treated with clarithromycin, okay? Um, so that, that so if, when I start somebody initially on treatment, I'm often going to go for doxy first. If, if they have a lot of myalgia pain, that sometimes can be uh, caused by a hidden anaplasma or erlichia co-infection. Doxy for at least a month takes care of those, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Patsy. Hi, Dr. Ross. Is it a fact that bacteria don't do well in a more alkaline environment? If so, would taking baking soda or apple cider vinegar and water help alkalize? How much does someone take? Thanks for all you do. So um, there is a theory that that's so. Uh, the truth is when I've had people try to do more alkaline diets, because you can read it, you can Google alkaline diet, you'd find the various foods that you want to have to make your blood more alkaline. The truth is, I just don't find it to make any difference, okay? So that would be my point on that. All right. Good luck to you, Patsy. Hello, Maggie. Let's see. Have you ever heard of the symptoms of feeling like you have a knot in your throat? I don't feel any goiter, but I've also never had a scan. It just feels like I'm not sometimes in the throat where tension runs down through one shoulder. So a sensation of having a knot in the throat can sometimes be a neurologic sensation, could be part of a Bartonella or Lyme, for instance. Sometimes a knot in the throat can be because you've had a lot of acid reflux from your stomach going up and irritating the throat and that area of the throat, okay? And the only way you're gonna be able to figure that out is to have somebody take a look down your throat, usually an ear, nose, and throat doctor with a fiber optic scope, okay? And then the other thing that can give you that sensation of a knot in the throat 
is if you develop too many yeasts that are actually living up in your food pipe. That sometimes can do it too, okay? Um, I suggest talking with your doctors about this and see if they can help you investigate further to figure out which of those things it might be, okay? All right, good luck to you, Meg. Hello, Martin. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. You are an absolute star. <laughs> Thank you. I like your first name, too, by the way. <laughs> we have the same name. Uh, let's see. Um, I've been positively tested for Bartonella, Anaplasma, Chlamydia, and Borrelia in my um, central um, or cerebral spinal fluid. I currently treat Bartonella by taking 600 milligrams a day of rifamp rifampicin and 500 milligrams a day of azithromycin combined with liposomal oils. Over a year, muscle tendon pain has been worsening despite um, having been added corticosteroids for two weeks by my physician. After decreasing the dosage, I'm not taking the cortic corticosteroids anymore. Everything just gradually worsens as if I have been taking nothing, quite the opposite. The CRP has increased from 26 before treatment to 40 after two months of the antibiotics. Should I change the antibiotics or just haven't been helping for already two months? If yes, for which? Or should I add those two minocycline is already the third? If yes, what dosage? How is it possible that the CRP has increased while treated with antibiotics? Thank you, uh, Martin. All right. So, Martin, it's... Um, I'm just going to give you an observation to something to talk over with your doctors. The trouble is I would to help figure out what's going on here, whether it's your antibiotics aren't working or uh, whether there's something else going on here. I need to ask you a lot of clinical questions, and obviously I can't do that in this format. The one thing that can sometimes lead to a worsening inflammatory picture and even worsening feeling symptomatic-wise of how you're doing while you're on antibiotics is if those antibiotics also disturbed your gut microbiome and triggered too many yeast to live in your intestines, okay? Remember earlier tonight when I was talking about cytokines and what triggers cytokines, one of the things I said is that cytokines can be triggered by too many yeast in your intestines, all right? And if you get too many yeast in the intestines, they also release toxins that get um, absorbed into the bloodstream and, and some people can worsen your neurologic symptoms as well too. So if I've got a person that I have on antibiotics and they're worsening even two months down the road, I'm always going to want to ask questions to figure out, could there be too many yeast? And these are things you might want to look at with your physician. Okay, so number one, a uh, symptom that makes me think of too many yeast is um, having increased sugar cravings, having increased intestinal gassiness or bloating. I'm having changes in skin, like skin rashes, eczematous rashes, or um, even pimples and acne increasing. And that is these toxins that get released by yeast that get into your bloodstream, interact with the skin, leading to worsening skin rashes and even pimples and acne, okay? So um, I would, you know, consider that with your physician. And if they decide it's not a problem with, uh, um, uh, with uh, yeast, then it may be time to look at other alternatives to treat your Bartonella with, because it would I would suggest if it isn't yeast, that this combination is not working, okay? So other things that you could consider would be uh, switch out that azithromycin and use clarithromycin, um, 500 milligrams twice a day. You could consider using Diflucan to treat Bartonella. I, I mentioned that in my Bartonella article. Um, and if you do that, it actually would take care of yeast if you develop too many yeast as well, too, okay? And there's a whole host of other options you have, but if it's not yeast and you're two months into this and you're worsening, I would consider changing to other Bartonella treatment options. But look to see if it's yeast first. Consider that with your physician, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Martin. Martin, I showed you my article earlier tonight called Kills Bartonella, A Brief Guide. And in there, I list a number of other antibiotic options you could use to treat Bartonella. Generally, uh, when you're on a right treatment for Bartonella, if yeast have not popped up, um, generally by two months, you should be starting to go in a positive direction. And if not, then you want to look at using something else. Okay. All right. 
Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Robert. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks so much for all you do uh, You're for us. You're welcome. Let's see. I increased my curcumin to two pills three times a day, and it has really helped with heart sync. Great. It can make a big difference, actually. My question, I've been taking ATP 360 for several months. If I was to try BPC-157, would that reduce, replace, or work in conjunction with the ATP 360 since the peptide also provides mitochondria support? So it would, um, BPC-157, again, the peptide can help mitochondrial function, okay? So, but in a different mechanism than what the ATP 360 does. The ATP 360, which is a product made by Research Nutritionals, the main parts of ATP 360 is that it has a bunch of phospholipids in it. And phospholipids um, are used to repair the covering of the mitochondria that can get injured when you have chronic infection, all right? And so specifically, it rebuilds the fat covering. In addition, the ATP 360 in it has a bunch of micronutrients that help the chemical reactions of the mitochondria work better. So you can use the two together. Right? And actually, I do that in my practice um, uh, with good success, okay? So the ATP 360 would be um, as a three pills uh, one time a day. BPC-157, I usually start people at one pill um, twice a day, okay? All right. Um, good luck. And thank you for that question. Hello, Sean. Let's see. Is burning skin a symptom of any of the tick-borne infections, or is that probably just psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis? It's been exacerbated by the infection. All right. So burning skin without an obvious skin problem, meaning your skin looks normal, I would think of neuropathy. Uh, we think of nerve injury, okay? Now, if your burning skin is only in areas that have obvious signs of inflammation, then that could be from your psoriasis or could be from your psoriatic arthritis, okay? All right. Uh, but burning skin with normal-looking skin often means neurologic uh, uh, neuropathy, okay, or nerve injury. And a symptom of nerve injury can be a burning quality, um, which shows up as skin burning, all right? And Bartonella and Lyme would be the two infections that we think of as doing that, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Sean. Hello, Sherry. Let's see, I'm a former patient that you were treating for mold. Um, hello. Let's see, I have a question because I am still experiencing uh, my slurred speech and balance symptoms. Looking at my test results again from real-time labs, I was still positive by three times the normal limits for severe mycotoxins. Would that still cause symptoms, which, if I understand, can affect balance and slurred speech? Uh, and then you, you're listing out the ochratoxin, tricocetine, um, and et cetera. I mean, you're just listing out what your lab tests are. So, um, you know, Sherry, I, I have to be careful because I know you've identified yourself as a patient, but I have to respect the things that you wrote here. I can't say more than to talk about mold toxin illness, okay? Because you've addressed mold toxin illness here. For confidentiality reasons, which you haven't given me permission to talk about here, I can't talk about other possible causes that you could or could not have, including tick-borne infections, okay? But I'll just mention that. And, and frankly, I can't remember your tick-borne infection testing off my head, but um, obviously tick-borne infections can give you some of the symptoms you're talking about. But to answer your question here, could this level of uh, mycotoxins still give you some of the slurring of the speech? The answer is, I would say, is yes, they could. Okay. All right. Um, and, you know, at this point, if you are living in a clean environment, if you're sure that you're not getting any further mycotoxin exposures from your workplace or your home um, or your car, um, then I would start thinking, I hope that whoever's working with you now, in addition to having you on binders, is doing something to kill for, um, treat for possible mold colonization, where you might have mold spores that have set up shop in your nose passages and even in your intestines and uh, causing you to produce your own um, toxins, okay? All right, so um, the other thing, 
there always is that possibility of tick-borne infection. And again, I just, I'm not remembering everything off the top of my head about you, okay? All right, so I can't comment specifically about that. But to answer your question, could these levels still lead you to those kind of problems? Yeah, they could, okay. Um, all right, good luck to you, Sherry. Hello, John. Does bentonite clay contain lead? Any side effects you have been seen using it? Um, you know, John, I don't, I, boy, I'd have to look and see. But actually, let's look together. Hold on a minute. We're going to pull up my product here real quick. All right, so if this had, this is MediClay, which is the, uh, the product I use. And if they sell in California, then this should have a label on it that says, watch out for lead. So hold on here a minute. Okay, so this product appears not yeah, okay, so yeah, that's true. So this product, this Medi Clay made by Premier Labs, um, is actually heavy metal tested and it's negative, okay? Um, if it was not free of heavy metals, based on California law, there should be a label on here because they sell in California that would say, be aware this could have lead, okay? So this product is not. Now, not all Medi, not all betonite clay would be lead free, but this one, um, is a lead a lead free um, type? Okay, all right, all right. Good luck to you. Hello, Carter. Carter, let's see. Internal vibration seemingly emanating from this spine. I've lost a lot of fat. Do you think this could be hyperthyroid? I would look at thyroid, but again, uh, what I see a vibrating sensation often can mean a Bartonella infection, okay? Um, but have your doctors help you look at that, okay? Right. Good luck to you. Hello, Teddy. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Can you talk a little bit about butter burr as a preventive for daily migraine head pain? And how often do you need to check the liver wall on it? Do you stay on it continuously or take a break? So butter burr is a plant. It's dosed as 50 milligrams three times a day. And it's been shown in laboratory studies to be as effective as any of the prescription uh, um, uh, migraine preventive medicines, okay? It, it can work quite well. It doesn't work in everyone, but it can work quite well. Um, I have never seen anyone have developed liver enzyme elevations on it. And I have people just take it continuously, one pill three times a day. Um, um, if you are concerned, I would probably check after about one month and get a liver test. And if it's normal, I think you're good to go. But again, I've never seen an elevation happen from that. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Mosby. Let's see, I've noticed with me and a few other people that I've conversed with that um, have Lyme, a strange vitamin D paradox where our blood levels are low, but when we try to raise our D levels, I feel terrible like autoimmune and mast cell activation all wrapped up. Is there something that goes on with the vitamin D receptors or kidney problems with the conversion? The only thing I could find was Marshall Protocol and while I don't agree with the protocol, his research and observation were spot on with what I experienced. Um, you know, I, uh, unfortunately, Mosby, I don't have a good explanation for you on this one. Um, I don't know is where I'm going to leave it. Okay. I, I, I don't, I'm not a big believer in the Marshall Protocol. I, I think um, it worked well for Dr. Marshall and his uh, sarcoidosis, but in terms of 
being a, a viable protocol to treat Lyme and, 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 and tick-borne infections, I never found it to be useful, to be quite honest, okay? Um, yeah, that's all I can say. All right, good luck to you. Hello, Lisa. Let's see. Significant cranial instability. I feel like the muscles in my neck are very weak and aren't stabilizing my spine correctly. Have you seen this before? Um, I have seen it in a few patients. Um, it can be due to neurologic weakness or neuro neurologic uh, neuropathy, making it so that the muscles in the neck don't work correctly. Um, sometimes physical therapy can help. Sometimes neck braces can help. But yeah, it's something I have seen before. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Lisa. Hello, Kate. Do you find that the lower LDN doses are still effective? I'm only taking for general autoimmunity after healing from Lyme. LDN was God 10 for, uh, for quelling the immune overstimulation, by the way. I feel like the higher doses of two to 4.5 milligram caused me muscle tension. Insight, thanks. Um, so, you know, um, so with, so everyone, naltrexone um, is a narcotic blocker, right? So at regular doses, the way it's manufactured is a 50 milligram pill. It's used in emergency settings for people that have drug overdoses um, to knock um, opioids um, off of narcotic receptors in the body and uh, get rid of the, the overdose situation, okay? It also, at hot regular doses of the 50 milligram pill, can be used as a part of a program to, to prevent alcoholism as well, to, or to treat alcoholics. Um, in the world of Lyme um, and in the world of autoimmune illnesses, it can be used at low doses, uh, up to 4.5 milligrams a day, to actually act uh, to block what are known as endorphin receptors in the body. Our body has a natural pain system called endorphins. We manufacture endorphins to regulate pain, but those endorphins also regulate the immune system. And what happens if you do a temporary blockade of about four to six hours of those endorphin receptors by using low dose naltrexone, um, what happens is those receptors when they're blocked become more sensitive to endorphins so that when the blockade goes away, they are, they are super sensitive. They'll have a big effect from endorphins landing on them, okay? But the other thing that happens is the brain um, starts sending out signals to the endorphin producing cells when, when those receptors are blocked to make more endorphins. So the effect is you after the, it wears off, you've got these hypersensitive endorphin receptors and you've got excess endorphins sitting out there and they hit the endorphin receptors and it regulates the immune system from having an autoimmune tendency towards being more balanced and not having autoimmune inflammation. Okay, that's how it works in theory. There are some people that are very sensitive to the doses and often the sensitivity uh, can be some more of um, um, brain fog. Some people get hallucinations. Um, I haven't heard of anyone getting muscle tension, but I would assume it's a neurologic type symptom that sometimes can happen with neurologic symptoms, sometimes can happen with low dose naltrexone, although I haven't seen this one. What I have found in my practice, though, is that for people that are super sensitive, you usually can find a dose they'll tolerate. And even at low doses, people get benefit. So to answer your question, yes, at low doses, people can still get benefit, even under the 4.5 milligrams. Okay. All right. So let me do a quick screen share here. So if you're looking for information about this low-dose naltrexone, take a look up here in the immune system section and take a look at um, All right, take a look at this article called LDN for Lyme, and where I explain all about low dose naltrexone too. Okay, actually, I'm just looking down here. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. All right. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Kate.
Hello, Marianne. Once you have Lyme for a few years, will you always test positive? Um, so it depends on which test was done. So, um, so in some people, we can get rid of Lyme. Okay, I just want to say that. In some people, we don't. In some people, the best we're doing with treatment is to knock the germ load down so the immune system keeps it under control. All right. But even if you do get rid of Lyme, you will still make antibodies against the germ. So antibodies, again, are proteins made by a type of white blood cell called B cells. These proteins, these antibodies, uh, whenever you have an infection, will land on the germ, they attach to the germ, and then they act as a signaling device uh, for uh, other types of white blood cells to come in and gobble up the germ. Okay, that's kind of a, a description of what antibodies are, right? So uh, antibody testing that is done in Lyme that can remain positive goes by a number of names. That would be something called an IFA test. It'd be something called an ELISA test. There's also what is known as a Western blot, and there's something called an immunoblot. These are antibody tests, okay? You, once you make antibodies, it is possible you will keep making them even after the germ is gone. So yeah, they may remain positive, okay? All right, there's another way to test for Lyme, which is to do something called an L-spot. An L-spot uh, measures whether you've got activation of a type of white blood cell called a T-cell. T-cells um, uh, circulate and attack germs, and they have a circulation lifespan of two months, okay? So that's your circulating T-cells. However, there's also what are known as memory T cells, and they don't circulate, but occasionally some of them get into your bloodstream, okay? So in an L-spot test, what is done is we take your blood, we take the T cells, we put them in a test tube, and then we introduce into the test tube proteins of the germ we're trying to see if you might have reactivity against. In this case, it would be Borrelia Lyme, okay? So we have your test tube full of white T white blood cells, we take uh, Lyme proteins, put them in the test tube, and then we measure whether those T white blood cells produce um, cytokines, all right? And if they do, they're making cytokines because they remember seeing Lyme, okay? Now, presumably, the majority of cells that we're going to draw in your blood are the circulating T cells, not the memory T cells. And if you have, if presumably, if you have not seen your immune system has not seen Lyme actively in the blood, then your T cells will not, uh, the L spot would be negative. So a negative L spot sometimes can happen after you get rid of the infection. However, it's, it may miss Lyme that is still hiding in you, okay? And in addition, sometimes the memory T cells get out and what you're measuring is really the activity of the memory of the immune system and so um, just having a positive L-spot test does not necessarily mean the germ is still active because it could be a measurement of the memory side of the immune system. Okay. All right. So anyhow, that's complicated stuff, but I hope that answers your question. There. Hello, Tim. Let's see. When should you consider cancer with the Lyme infections? It's hard to say. I mean, there's, um, there was a physician uh, named Neil Spector that um, died of Lyme and uh, had, had to have a heart transplant because of Lyme and eventually died. Some of his work that he did before he died was looking at the cancer link mainly with breast cancer. And there, I think breast and maybe ovarian cancer, I think he showed some linkage, but it's still an area that we don't know a lot about. So in terms of whether Lyme can cause cancer, I think we're still learning. Um, in terms of, can you have symptoms that we sometimes attribute to Lyme and really be caused by something else? Yeah, that's possible. So um, you need to talk to your physician to make sure that they've ruled out other things you can have in, in addition to having Lyme that gives you your symptoms, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Tim. Hello, Charles. Let's see. Would one teaspoon of D-ribose per day be contraindicated with an intestinal yeast issue? And does taking a binder... 
colecybolam and GI detox tend to get less painful as you get the toxins out there, so you should increase the dose. So the answer is, as you pull toxins out, you should have less cytokine surges, therefore less pain, and you should be able to gradually increase those binders, okay? In terms of D-ribose, which is a sugar source that is an energy source for your mitochondria, it is generally not what I would consider to be a fuel source for yeast, and you should be able to take it, okay? All right, good luck to you, Charles. Hello, Beth. Let's see. Dear Dr. Ross, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Let's see. My 19-year-old son has diagnosed with Lyme and Bartonella last August. He had two months of doxycycline, then two months of pulsing with augmentin, minocycline, azithromycin, and tindamax. After this, he was better for two months, but then started having severe GI symptoms, feeling bloated, sick, and totally exhausted for two hours after eating anything. His fasting blood sugars are high. GI map showed high normal H. pylori and slightly high bacteroides, um, bacillus, and streptococcus species. His doctor put him on GI microbe X and uh, pyloracil for possible H. pylori and SIBO. After three weeks on that, he started having what seemed like a really bad herx. Can H. pylori or SIBO die off cause a herx? Or do GI microbe X and pyloracil cause Lyme or Bartonella to die off? Have you ever seen type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance develop um, uh, due to Lyme or a co-infection? How do you treat it? And is shortness of breath and hyper, hypertension a typical Lyme symptom? He also has shortness of breath now. Okay, so hypertension is not something I would think of as being a typical Lyme symptom. Shortness of breath is typically not from Lyme. It could be from asthma. It could be from a missed co-infection or active co-infection like Bartonella can give you shortness of breath, okay? And um, so anyhow, maybe his Bartonella is still active. Um, I don't know. I don't get to ask you a lot of questions to figure that out, but it's something to think about, all right? In terms of uh, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and Lyme, I haven't seen a relationship between those two. Could treating SIBO and H. pylori give a Herxheimer reaction? Yes, they could. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, the thing I'm struck by, though, is I would still consider whether your son has too many yeast in his intestines, okay? The greater likelihood he took all these antibiotics, he feels a lot worse after he eats, is most likely there's a, there's a great chance this is still intestinal yeast overgrowth. Intestinal yeast overgrowth is a relative issue, meaning, you could still have what would be quantified as normal yeast on a stool test, but they might be too much for you, all right? So there is not really an adequate test we can do that tells if you have too many yeast, even if you do stool testing, it's not adequate. You have to go by clinical symptoms. So the first thing I do before ever I go for H. pylori and SIBO, and somebody that's been treated with antibiotics, develops a lot of GI symptoms, has marked decline like you're describing, is to actually go after yeast first without testing. And then if they don't get better, I might come back and do testing, okay? That's my approach, all right? All right, um, good luck for your son. In terms of what to do for yeast and how to test for, or how to figure out yeast, I'll show you some articles to take a look at, okay? All right, so take a look in my yeast chapter here. And there's this article called, A Silent Problem, Is It Yeast? I walk through how you figure out yeast. And in this article called, Kills Yeast, A Brief Guide, I talk with you about uh, how to figure it out or, uh, or how to treat it, okay? The other thing I would have you take a look at as a good starting point about various forms of GI distress and infections is um, take a look in my stomach and intestines chapter and take a look at this article here at the bottom called Intestinal Dysfunction Symptoms, Tests, and Treatments. 
where I walk you through how to figure out uh, causes of bloating, cramping, and feeling worse after sugar, including SIBO, yeast, uh, gastrointestinal overgrowth of all kinds of things. Take a look at this article, okay? Hello, Brandy. Let's see. Do you ever see keratosis polaris ever since a tick bite? My skin is not like sandpaper. So, yeah, and keratosis polaris, what you're describing there, uh, sometimes can be tick associated and, and it often can get better as you treat your underlying tick infections. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Jules. Hi, Dr. Ross. I was wondering if you see inflamed liver spleen with Babesia herxing. My husband began treatment and started to see bouts of dark urine every few days. I've heard this could be a sign that treatment is working. The infected RBCs are being excreted. We're getting a CBC CMP this week, but we are told not to worry if, if his liver enzymes are a bit higher right now. Thank you. So the answer is, yeah, occasionally you can. Um, rarely I see it, but occasionally you can. All right. Good luck. So everyone, what's happened is I've got two areas that questions will show up here. They show up on a chat section and they show up on a Q&A section on my screen. And I just flip back over to my chat section and I see that a number of you posted your questions both places. So I'm just pulling some of those out. Hello, Maggie. Let's see. Best severe Herx remedy. Um, so uh, for Herxes, I like to use curcumin, which is that Thorn Mariva 500 product, liposomal curcumin, 500 milligrams three times a day. If that's not effective enough, I increase it to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. In addition, I like to use that along with liposomal glutathione. The product I like for that is a product made by Thorn called... Um, Try Fortify, either Try Fortify Orange or Try Fortify Watermelon. And you want to do a teaspoon once a day and can even increase to one teaspoon twice a day. For severe, severe um, herxes, you might consider even doing intravenous glutathione. You would need to have, obviously, somebody help you with that. And I will dose all the way up to 2,500 milligrams of it, um, even twice a week if needed. Um, I give that as an IV push over about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Maggie. Let me see. I want to just do a quick screen share here and show you something. So in terms of looking at options to treat Herxes, uh, take a look in my Herxheimer and Cytokines chapter. Take a look at this article called Herxheimer Die-Off Reaction Inflammation Run Amok. And all the way down here, I give you various options, including doing the IV glutathione. I talk about it right here at the bottom of the article, okay? Hello, Paula. See, does active Lyme Bartonella make COVID worse? The answer is it could. I mean, you know, the reason you feel bad in COVID is your um, immune system overproduces cytokines. Okay. The main reason you feel bad in Lyme is your immune system overproduces cytokines. So the two of them coupled together, yeah, it could, it could make COVID worse. But the reality is I haven't seen my patients that have Lyme that is active and get COVID have any worse of a chance getting over it than an average person who doesn't have Lyme, okay? All right, 
Uh, good luck to you, Paula. All right, so that's it for me for tonight, everyone. Um, uh, so it's been good being with you here. Uh, we'll be back here again with you next week. Um, tomorrow morning when you get the email from me um, announcing that the recording is ready, you can all, and, and with links to that recording, uh, you can also use links there to sign up for next week's webinar, okay? Um, it's been good being with you tonight. I'm actually getting ready to head out for some, to see some friends as, um, this is a big event in my life. Uh, tomorrow is my 60th birthday. <laughs> I have no idea how I got to this point and I am in constant shock about that. But uh, so I'm going over to see some good friends this evening to celebrate on the eve of my birthday. And then tomorrow I'm going out um, after I get everything sent out in the morning, I'm going out on a two day motorcycle trip um, uh, with a, a friend of mine. So, um, so that's how I'm celebrating, but that's what I'm on the verge of doing here. Um, good night, everyone, and uh, glad to have spent my pre-birthday with you. Uh, all right. Take care.